Good morning, everybody. Shall we start? Dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome. Welcome to this uh, first webinar for the introduction of the WHO uh, Labor Care Guide. This tool for implementing the recommendation of intrapartum care for a positive childbirth experience which was launched in uh, 2018 by WHO. This, uh, I'm Dr. Chifoni Murunziza. I uh, will be chairing the meeting. I want to say welcome to all of you. This webinar is prepared for you in collaboration with UNFPA, UNICEF, WHO, and the World Continuing Education Alliance supported by the Together for SRH program. I'm pleased and honored to present to you the agenda of today for the two hours that we have together. I don't know how to go to the next slide. So do you see my screen? Yes, we see it. Okay. So as I was saying, uh, I'm Dr. Trifoni Gurunziza, I'm chairing this, this session. And uh, I want to, I hope you see on the screen the agenda of the meeting. Um, the welcome, the overview of the agenda is what we are doing now. And uh, this will be followed by uh, the opening remarks. Uh, we will have the opportunity to have Fran, Fran McConville, Technical Officer for Midwifery at WHO Headquarters, and uh, Yoti Tewari, the Health System Advisor from UNFPA, East and Southern African region. And uh, we were supposed to have uh, Dr. Geoffrey Bisoborwa, Director at uh, I for the Universal Health Life Course at WHO Afro, but he will not be available because he has just been called to another equally important and urgent meeting. And then, but I will do the welcome, the opening remark for him. Uh, then we'll be followed by uh, the, the overview of the WHO Labor Care Guide that will be given by, by Dr. Mercedes Bonne, is a medical officer at the WHO headquarters level. Um, and then uh, this will be followed by questions and clarification that will be led by Fatima Gohar from UNICEF SRO. And then a, 30, a 60 minutes really to go in depth on how to use the WHO Labor Care Guide. And uh, this will be presented by, we do have experience from two countries, Argentina and Tanzania. Then uh, we have 30 minutes of questions and clarification that will be led by Muna Abdallah, the health system advisor from UNFPA SRO. And uh, we have some remarks from Jennifer Nyoni, the team lead for the, work, uh, the uh, health workforce at uh, the WHO Regional Office for Africa in Brazzaville. And then also by Fatima Goha, uh, from UNICEF SRO, and then uh, we have the next steps and the closure by um, Nancy Kidula. 
uh, there is a slight change in the agenda. So uh, if there is no, no comment on the agenda, uh, I would be pleased to call upon Fran McConville, uh, technical officer at WHO headquarters to give her remarks. Uh, over to you, Fran, and welcome again. This is very exciting. Thank you, uh, Tiffany. I hope uh, you can hear me and I think uh, people can see me. Um, yes. Okay. You're good. <laughs> okay. So, um, Firstly, thank you uh, to everyone who's joined and hello um, from, from all of us. And it's just wonderful, really wonderful to know that there are so many uh, midwives and others uh, joining this really important uh, meeting on the, on the new labor care guide um, in AFRO. And it, it's just so great to have so many midwives together, actually. So um, I'm Fran and I am the midwifery technical officer uh, based in WHO headquarters in the Department of Maternal and Newborn Child Adolescent Health and Aging. Um, and I've been there for about eight years and spent the previous 30 odd years um, working internationally um, in midwifery. And I, I want to thank all the midwives um, on the call, uh, midwives and nurses, I am both, um, for your, your, from WHO really, for your hard work and commitment. You were working in the most extraordinarily difficult circumstances and yet you continue to be dedicated. I think the DG and our chief nursing officer who's also a midwife Elizabeth are never ever stop thinking about about the hard work that you do and in the year of the nurse and midwife you were really outstanding. We were so proud of everything that midwives everywhere did but in Africa my goodness you really were outstanding and uh, we really appreciate you for that. We want you to know that and especially around COVID, you have sacrificed so much um, to help others. So we really want you to know that WHO is, is so supportive of you and appreciative of you. And it's just wonderful that in huge numbers, you have come now to learn how to take forward and how to improve quality of care uh, during childbirth through this meeting. So just, just a couple of points for me as a midwife. Um, I know that when you're a midwife who leads care, you fill out what was the partograph more than any other professional. Uh, you are the one who has that responsibility for the woman, her newborn, and the family all together. Um, it really is life-saving. It's how you find out when things aren't quite right and you call in the right help or, or you start referring, but it really makes you think. And it's also about accountability. The, the record is something that that woman, the family, the baby will always have, but it also demonstrates when you use this partograph, now the labor care guide well, that you are a real professional, you know what you're doing, and that's good for you because it shows that you have acted in absolutely the right way to give the best quality of care to that, that mother and baby. So the labor care guide looks different. We're all a bit used to the partograph, um, but I have to say it, it, it doesn't take too long to get into it. Um, and when you start using it, it really is great. We know that we've been field testing it through our midwifery education program in, in the Southeast Asian region. And what I love about it really is that it's not just the clinical part of midwifery care. Um, it really is about ensuring a woman has a positive experience of care. And that's where you as midwives come in. It's about her respect and her dignity. It's about her emotional support. It's about good communications. And for me, it's really exciting to see we can actually, it's really important on this form that we fill out something that says she's moving. She's not stuck on a bed, strapped to the bed with an infusion in, she's mobile, she's drinking, she's talking, she has a companion with her, she is and cared for during her childbirth. And that, as we know, releases oxytocin, it improves childbirth, makes it such a much more positive experience. So um, I don't want to say much more other than welcome. I think this is a really exciting day. Um, please enjoy this. Um, you'll, you'll get the knack of it, I know. And uh, hopefully when the pandemic calms down and we're all vaccinated, um, I'll get the chance to come and work with you um, and support you on this. Um, so thank you again for joining. It's great to have all our partners on board. I'm going to say hello from Hilma at ICM too, because she's unable to join. So I'll hand back now um, to Tripani. Thank you, Tripani. Uh, thank you, Fran. Uh, I know how you are excited and passionate about this. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the works. Uh, and uh, now 
I'm very pleased to call upon Yoti. Is it Yoti or Muna who will deliver the, uh, the, uh, the remark for UNFPA? Um, you? Yeah. Yoti is here. Yeah. Yeah. OK, Yoti, uh, welcome. And uh, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Trefani, and it's brilliant to see Fran. Uh, Fran, if I remember, I used to work for you in Deep Defeat, if, if, if you remember, long time back, I guess, yeah. So I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this exercise, and on behalf of the joint UN team, uh, WHO, UNICEF, UNFPA, and the World Continuing Education Alliance, I thank you all, and then, then and for taking time out for this uh, webinar. And it's really, really amazing. I mean, we have over 400 people uh, from almost all our Eastern Southern Africa country. Uh, that clearly shows this power of uh, these digital solutions. Uh, uh, so I believe uh, uh, in, in, in a short period of time, you are likely to translate uh, this particular guidance into some kind of a modular e-learning and learning training as well that will be absolutely brilliant uh, so and then and basically i have nothing more to say we're absolutely delighted and it all uh, seems like falling into place and this is our 16th webinar if i'm not uh, wrong so but i have three things for all of us to consider uh, particularly uh, our leads from three un agency uh, at country offices. The first thing in our region, we have over 125,000 uh, midwife, uh, nurse and auxiliary midwives. Uh, and the power of these digital platforms are so good. How can we expand this platform and bring in as many as, uh, as many midwives uh, into this platform? That's something for us to consider. Uh, and also we all recognize uh, many of our midwives uh, perhaps do not have connectivity, uh, perhaps do not have smart devices. Uh, what kinds of innovation we could think about. And we're really, really fortunate that we have resources for the first time to continue this platform for a while if we find this useful and successful. And then, and, and then there are quite a few innovations that could be done, such as providing smartphones to maybe midwife through some kind of their salary adjustment or, or, or bringing in the private sector. And already we are in conversation of few of those opportunities. So basically at the country level, I really, really request each one of us to look at innovative ways of reaching to as many midwives, uh, uh, nurse and auxiliary midwives as possible and bring into this uh, virtual learning platform. So that's, 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 the, that's the, the uh, second one. The third one, uh, some kind of a beyond this occasional webinar, uh, because there is so much of interest. I'm just wondering whether we could also create a network, an ongoing network of midwives through this particular platform. So even if someone not able to join a particular webinar, a particular uh, module, could still be part of our larger network, and then a two-way communication can take place between us and the midwives in the region. So with those three questions, basically, I again welcome you all and then hand it back to Dr. Tripani, but as, as, as a UNFPA uh, regional office and then the coordinator for integrated SRHR team in the regional office, this is, we are so thrilled and my RD and then my technical head in the headquarters is absolutely thrilled to be part of this uh, platform and then able to reach out to thousands of midwife, hopefully <laughs> in a few months time uh, with uh, SRHR solutions. So back to you, Trifoni, and thank you so much uh, for, for, for this partnership. And then thank you all for, for participating in this important webinar. Uh, back to you. 
thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Jyoti, for those encouraging words and those questions that are worth really taking on board. Um, I'm pleased now to deliver the opening remarks from uh, uh, the director uh, of universal uh, life co health coverage and the life course in Afro, Dr. Bisoborwa Joffre. So, so those are his words. Distinguished participants, dear friends, uh, dear colleague, representative from ICM, nursing registrar, National Nurse and Midwifery Associations, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Good morning, good afternoon from wherever you are. It's my distinct, distinct pleasure to be with you all today. This webinar jointly convened by WHO, UNICEF, and UNFPR SRO to introduce the WHO Labor Care Guide, otherwise known as the WHO Next Generation Pathograph to midwives and nurses in the African region. Colleague, uh, as you say, you know, the death of women during pregnancy and childbirth and in the postnatal period continue to be a major problem in the region with Sub-Saharan Africa accounting for two thirds of globally recorded maternal death. Current projection, suggests that at the current annual reduction or rate of 2.9%, Africa will not meet the SDG target for maternal mortality reduction of 70 per 100 life births by 2030. This calls for urgent, urgent focus and focused and accelerated action by country if the region really hope to end preventable maternal and perinatal mortality. We know from available evidence that uh, improving the quality of care around the time of birth, including during labor and delivery, is the most effective strategy for reducing uh, maternal and perinatal mortality with triple returns on investment. A key aspect of intrapartum care is monitoring labor, previ previously done using the partograph. In 2018, WHO announced intrapartum care recommendations for a positive childbirth experience with updated labor monitoring guidance based on available evidence. Subsequently, a new labor monitoring tool was developed to align with the updated recommendation for intrapartum care. This new tool, now known as the WHO Labor Care Guide, together with its user manual, was launched on 15 December 2020. You also know that WHO declared 2020 as the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife in recognition of the, your vital role, not just in maternal newborn health services, but in all primary healthcare services. In fact, the WHO Re Director General, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, has reaffirmed that nurses and midwives are actually the backbone of every health system, and especially for maternity care services. Their acceptance and understanding of the labor care guide is therefore very important for rapid uptake and utilization of this very important tool in labor and delivery units across the region. So we urge you, therefore, to pay careful attention to the explanation provided and to study the document given to you from this webinar. We also encourage you to disseminate the information learned through all possible forums that your peers and other health workers who did not have the opportunity to attend this webinar 
so that they can have a clear understanding of the new labor care guides. For those of you who are lecturers, professors, master trainers, we urge you to review your curricula and content to ensure that this tool is part of the pre and in-service training. In conclusion, allow me to thank for all of you to take the time to attend this uh, workshop. I would also like to thank the panelists led by Dr. Mercedes Bonne Semenas from WHO headquarters, the World Continuing Education Alliance platform for hosting this webinar, the organizing team comprising of Fatima Goa from UNICEF SRO, Muna Abdullah from UNFPA SRO, and Nancy Kidula from the WHO Intercountry Support in East and South, Southern uh, Africa region. And for all the facilitating team for your hard work in preparing for and conducting this webinar. Let me also reiterate our gratitude to the Swedish government through the Together for SRHR initiative for providing the funding to, to support the learning collaborative. Finally, on behalf of the WHO Afro region, I wish to reiterate our commitment to supporting midwifery care in the region, and I wish you all fruitful deliberation. This is for, for, is for our director. So now, I uh, please ready to introduce the, the Dr. Mercedes Bonne Semenas, who is going to actually give you all uh, what is important to know on the WHO Labor Care Guide. So Mercedes Bonnet is a perinatal health epidemiologist. She's based in the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research at the WHO uh, 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 office in Geneva. And she has ex extensive experience in global health with a particular interest on improving the health and the well being of women and newborns through research and development of evidence based recommendations and tools around care during childbirth and the postnatal period, maternal infection, and sepsis. Dr. Mercedes will give us a 15 minute presentation on the WHO label. Care guide, and I wish to welcome her to start her presentation. And I thank you. Thanks, Trifony, and um, I'm very pleased to be with you all here today. I will start sharing my screen. Okay, great. So um, we are here today, today to introduce you to the labor uh, care guide, which we think is uh, and will be a key tool for you midwives and nurses in um, the African continent. And as uh, we have been calling it, this is our new next generation uh, partograph and a tool that will help us implement um, the recommendations on intrapartum care for a positive uh, childbirth experience. We have structured our presentation in three main parts that uh, we will be covering um, after presenting to you the objective of this webinar. I will start describing to you uh, the labor care guide and my colleagues, um, Veronica and Rose, will take you over um, in more detail on how to complete the LCG. And towards the end, we will also point you to additional readings and resources that uh, WHO has issued along the uh, LCG, including a user manual that you 
will be using throughout this webinar, but also um, the different manuscripts that uh, we have published or are in press and that describe the process that we took to um, uh, develop the labor and care guide, as well as other WHO materials. We have uh, organized the webinar in um, a manner that will allow, I hope, a lot of interaction and um, allow time for questions. So I hope that uh, you will be posting those on, on the chat that we have for a Q&A. And uh, we will be try to respond to some of them written and then select some of them so we can respond to them um, live. And hopefully by the end of uh, the webinar today, you will be as enthusiastic as we are about the labor care guide and its potential to help you in providing high quality um, intrapartum care. So at the end of the webinar, we expect that you will be able to identify for whom, when, and where the labor care guide can be used, uh, recognize the principal elements and the sections of the uh, labor care guide, and um, have a good understanding on how to fill out the labor care guide and what additional resources are available to help you uh, to do that. So moving to the first part of the webinar, we wanted to start presenting to you the rationale behind developing the LCG, what is its scope and how it is structured. And that will be mainly my presentation before moving to the next um, part of the webinar on how to actually complete the tool. So why, why the labor care guy and why we are moving from uh, the previous partograph to this new revised next generation uh, partograph as we call it. This is um, mainly because following the publication of the WHO recommendations um, on intrapartum care for a positive childbirth experience, and that was in 2018, WHO initiated a process to revise the previous partograph to facilitate effective implementation of these recommendations. The recommendations are based, um, a lot of them, on a new understanding of the individual variability of um, labor progression that results in good perinatal uh, outcomes, both for the woman and for her baby. And it also includes a set of recommendations that were informed by that global shift towards also imp try improving, um, sorry, experience of childbirth. Uh, and all this necessitated the design of a new tool uh, that we call the WHO Labor Care Guide and that you can see feature here on, on the slide on, on the right side. And in this sense, the tool is um, established essential good quality and evidence-based care, but um, as I mentioned it in the previous slide, expands the focus also to allow a positive childhood experience. And you will, uh, see how we are addressing um, these issues in the labor and care guide. So uh, it, um, it is distinct from the previous partograph in its design, in the way it approach labor duration and how this is recorded. It has now triggers to help um, providers identify um, deviations from normality and also emphasizes respect for maternity care. And, but you will also see, and uh, I would like to reassure you that there's a lot of the underpinning concepts of the previous partograph that are maintained in the labor care guide. And there are uh, some of the um, sections and you will see the variables that are collected and monitored that have not changed. What are the aims of um, the labor care guide? So uh, the tool was designed for um, healthcare providers to monitor well-being of women and babies during labor uh, through our regular assessments. 
to also promote provision of supportive care throughout um, first and second stage um, of labor, assist you to promptly identify and address uh, any emerging labor complication. And this is um, done by providing uh, dress holes uh, for labor observations and um, allow you to identify those that may deviate from normal, what could be considered normal observations. So um, that will trigger um, additional um, action. It should also allow to prevent unnecessary use of interventions. And um, this point is mainly referring to um, the new knowledge that has been incorporated in the LCG around labor progression and um, with uh, the ultimate effect, uh, we hope that it will reduce unnecessary um, augmentation, for example, or uh, cesarean sections. The tool also aims to stimulate your decision making, and you will see the last uh, part of the tool that is um, new allows for um, recording all the assessments and the plans uh, of care that will be provided across um, and as the woman moves from uh, first stage uh, up to the end of second stage. And it's also intended to be a resource for audit uh, feedback and quality improvement that could be used in your facilities um, to improve uh, labor care. This slide is not moving. Okay. So before moving into the details on, um, of the tool and how to complete it, uh, let's see for whom, when, and where uh, you can uh, use the LCG. So it was designed for care of women and their babies during labor and birth. It includes assessments and observations that are essential for uh, the care of pregnant women, and this is regardless of their race status. However, um, in developing this tool, the approach that we took is that it was primarily designed to be used for the care of those women who um, came into the facilities in active first aid of labor and who are apparently healthy. So they have no known uh, risk factors. And I wanted to highlight that because it doesn't mean that you cannot use it in women who had risk factors or um, certain conditions, but they might require some additional care and specialized monitoring, including increased frequency of, on that monitoring or additional parameters that should be monitored uh, and that are not those that you should monitor um, in all women and therefore were not included in the LCG. When should you um, start using uh, the LCG? So when is that you open up uh, a new page for, for that woman? Uh, so uh, this is um, to be done when the woman enters active phase of first stage of labor. And this is uh, from five centimeters of cervical uh, dilatation uh, based on the new definitions that are in the 2018 WHO recommendations for a positive childbirth experience. And this is regardless of uh, her parity and membrane um, status. Uh, as the previous partograph, the LCG doesn't include uh, the latent phase. However, and I think that this is, uh, you all know, but uh, we think it's important to highlight that uh, those women in, still in light, latent phase, phase need to be monitored and receive um, labor care and support um, during that, that phase of, of labor. Once you have opened a labor care guide, uh, it will help you to continue, continuously monitor women throughout first and second stage of labor. Where should the labor care guide be used? So it was designed for use at all levels in healthcare facilities. Um, also, um, what might be different at different levels of care is the plan of action and uh, 
based on the protocols that you have in your facilities and the resources that are available, then the, the plan of action might be different at different levels of care, care for those um, women. Within the labor care guide should facilitate early identification of potential complications and therefore contribute to timely referrals too. So in the next two slides, I will introduce you to the labor care guide structure, and you will spend more time with my colleagues uh, in each of these uh, sections, and um, they will uh, show you how uh, those uh, shall be used and completed. So you can see on the slide and um, the labor care guide has seven sections that are listed here. And uh, you can see the different purple squares. I don't want to see this. Uh, yes. Sorry, I see this. We can't see the, the, your slides are not moving. Ah, uh, sorry. So which one are you seeing now? The labor care guide aims. Sorry, what about that now? No. No, let me stop sharing and I will reshare. Let's see if, um, I'm sorry for that. Uh, What about now? Can you see them moving? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you stop seeing this one, right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I think that I don't have to repeat what I said, but just to show you. So uh, for whom you can use the LCG, when you should um, start using it in the active first stage of labor. Um, to be used at all levels in, in the care facility. And I was here. So you can see now a structure of the WHO labor care guy on the slide. Just yeah. confirming, Nancy. Yep, yeah, we can yes. see it. OK, yes. perfect. OK. Um, so let, let me restart here. Uh, so the structure of the uh, labor care guide. And this is what I will show you in the next two slides, and hopefully you will be able to see the next one. Um, so it has different sections and components. Seven sections that are um, shown here and um, the purple squares uh, show the limits for section one up to section um, seven. And um, each of the sections have a list of observations that um, has to be monitored um, throughout first um, active first stage of labor and second stage uh, of labor. The first section is the one to identify the woman and labor characteristics at admission and will allow you to record um, any important um, characteristic of the woman, her pregnancy, and the onset of labor that are important for labor management, but also to identify whether she has any uh, risk. The section two is um, a new section uh, called supportive care. And uh, the aim of this section is to encourage consistent practice and respect for maternity care during uh, labor and, and childbirth, and includes um, offering companionship, pain relief, oral fluids, and um, mobility. Um, sections three and four refer to the care and monitoring of the baby and the woman and um, are there to allow you to regularly record important clinical parameters and their well-being. They remain basically the same uh, as those that uh, you found in the previous um, part to graph, uh, including fetal heart rate, position, 
uh, and for the woman, uh, the monitoring of uh, vital signs. Section five is labor progress and is where uh, some of the changes were also um, introduced in comparison to uh, the part to graph. And uh, also the principles of monitoring cervical dilatation and descent um, of the fit representing part against time remain the same as in the partograph. What um, have changed is the appearance and the limits that um, are now based on um, the most recent evidence that we have about um, labor uh, progression. Uh, and this section also allows, and this is similar to the previous partograph, um, describing duration and frequency of uh, uterine contractions. The last, um, sorry, section six is basically sim um, the same as in the previous partograph and allows for a recording of use of oxytocin, uh, IV fluids, or any other medicines that um, the woman should require uh, during um, labor. And uh, the last section is also new and is called shared decision making and is where um, we are prompting uh, midwives, healthcare providers to prospectively record a summary of the assessments that are done at a certain uh, point in time, but also to prospectively record what is the plan of care and what are the actions that will be taken, either to continue monitoring that woman and the baby because uh, progression of labor and all the other parameters are normal or whether there's a need uh, to uh, manage any potential uh, complication. So here you can see uh, the LCG uh, completed and uh, my colleagues, as I uh, said before, will uh, take you through. But um, what I wanted to highlight in this slide is that there's a time uh, axis that goes um, through our active first stage of labor and second stage of labor and allows you to um, record the times of uh, those observations. It has a column that is the alert column, and uh, this column provides um, thresholds or parameters against which you can compare your observations. So uh, to see whether there's any deviation and whether uh, action uh, is needed. And um, Veronica will explain you in a few minutes, but uh, once there's an observation that um, hit the values in the alert line, you can circle them so they are highlighted and you can visually see um, the problems that you have identified for this woman and um, her baby. We have um, published along the SCG a user's um, manual that was developed for a midwife and other um, health personnel providing care during labor and childbirth. Um, and uh, it is meant to help you understand the tool, how to complete it. It gives uh, some examples on how to do it. And um, if I can ask you just to have them handy, uh, both the LCG and the user manual, as uh, in the next part of the presentation, we will be asking you to refer to this uh, document. So the, the link to download those documents have been already shared, but maybe we can share it again. So those who join um, uh, after that could also have access uh, to um, those um, documents. So we have planned to stop here um, and uh, have some time for uh, questions uh, before we move on to uh, the next uh, presentation. And thanks for your attention so far.
thank you very much, Mercedes. And I think we do have uh, 10 minutes for questions and answers that will be led by Fatima. Fatima, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mercedes, for that wonderful presentation. Few questions what we have. Uh, there are very few questions for now. And uh, will uh, let me ask uh, if you could see the, the, the Google form where we have uh, put all the questions. One is, uh, has the other partograph been removed? And then um, uh, basically, one of our colleagues wants to understand how is this LCG different from partograph we used to monitor in labor. And um, maybe I think this would be um, OK. The, uh, there are other questions which are linked with practicality. For example, how how do we start plotting the graph? And, um, and, and then also some colleagues are asking if there will be a Portuguese version of this guide, because it's not available right now. Um, okay, maybe I yeah. can take Go those ahead. questions yeah, yeah, and then yeah. uh, all the questions are more practical around yes, how to complete yes. it. Uh, we can come back to them uh, at the end if, if, the, if the answers were not provided um, through the presentation. Um, so, um, so yes, this uh, labor care guide uh, was developed as a substitute of uh, the previous partograph. And this is why we call it the next generation partograph. It, it is an improved version. And uh, as uh, Fran mentioned it at the beginning, and um, I think that uh, as you start using it, you will realize that uh, the changes that have been introduced are those that uh, will help you um, provide a better uh, care um, to women and, and, and babies uh, during um, labor. Um, I tried throughout my presentation to point you to where the major changes were introduced and where um, the observations um, are pretty similar to um, the current uh, the, or the previous version of, of the partograph. So hopefully, as um, my colleague take you through those, you will be able to see. And uh, if we have time at the end, we can uh, summarize uh, in a um, brief manner uh, those similarities and the differences. But basically, um, the and as I say, the principles uh, of the partograph are maintained and the importance of continuously monitor women in labor uh, are the same. Uh, the major changes that I can highlight is that section on supportive care, that it's also meant to ensure that those practices that are not clinical, but that will not only help with the experience she's having uh, during labor, but we know that some of them it will reduce unnecessary interventions um, that um, um, we um, at WHO think uh, are very important. And then the change around the labor uh, progress um, and how this is done uh, based on uh, three of the recommendations that you can find in the WHO um, 2018 guideline. Uh, around uh, new knowledge that we have and we have what we have learned in all these decades about uh, labor progression. So we are, um, in terms of um, translations, we, um, the tool is already translated into Spanish and French, and we will be soon publishing the user manuals also into those uh, languages. We have no plans at the moment for a translation into Portuguese, but uh, and that's mainly because it's not a uh, United Nations official language, but um, 
we can certainly work with our colleagues in um, Afro office and, and, and see how we can ensure that um, this is um, available as we understand that it's um, important for introduction in, in countries and for um, a number of countries in, in, in the African uh, region. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question about uh, new topics introduced without logging in. Maybe that person can just reframe the, que reframe the question and then we can uh, come back to that one, that one um, at the end. Yeah, thank you, Mercedes. I think uh, most questions what our, our colleagues are very eager to know the practicalities of it, like, you know, linked to where, where is action line, alert line, decision and all those things. So okay. I just wanted to inform colleagues that uh, please um, just wait because our, uh, we have uh, other colleagues who would be presenting on those practicalities and you'll, you'll hear more about it. Um, so maybe I would say let's embark on to the second presentation so then we can get further clarities and we'll get back to you, Mercedes, uh, uh, in the next Q&A if, if needed. Perfect. Be. Sounds Thank great. You. So I will, I will continue sharing my um, screen for uh, Veronica. Okay. For, Thank for, you. For the okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mercedes and Fatim, for leading the discussion. We do have now two panelists that are actually going to show how to use the new photograph. Uh, we start by Dr. Veronica Pingre, who is a midwife and epidemiologist at the Institute for Clinical Effectiveness and Health Policy in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Her research uh, focuses primarily on maternal and perinatal health, with special emphasis on postpartum hemorrhage, stillbirth, intrapartum care, and the use of cesarean section. She, Veronica was part of the team coordinating the research study and the project evaluation to develop the uh, LCG and the, its user manual. So Veronica will present first, but uh, let me also introduce Rose Lesse who is a, uh, a senior lecturer in midwifery and women's health from the Archbishop Anthony Mayala School of Nursing, the Catholic University of Health and Allied Health Science in Mwanza, Tanzania. She coordinated the team that pilot tested the labor care guides in Tanzania. So we are really pleased to have uh, Veronica and Rose uh, showing us how to use the new paragraph. Let me give the floor to Veronica and then uh, to Rose. Veronica, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Well, uh, let me well. know. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, we will explore together the new labor care guide, this tool that was specially designed to help us provide quality care during labor and childbirth. As I was presenting, my name is Veronica Pingre, and I'm originally from Argentina, so I have a strong non-native English speaker accent. Apologies about that. Anyway, I will hope to be as clear as possible but feel free to ask for clarifications via chat if any topic is not clear enough for you. During the next hour, we are going to explore the following topics. Uh, first, how to complete the labor care guide section by section. What resources are available to help you complete the labor care guide? We will solve some clinical cases together and we will share some questions that we hope we can answer together. So we will invite you to participate in a live poll. Our colleague Rose uh, will walk you, walk, you, walk you through uh, some clinical examples. So thank you, Rose. Um, as for the poll, voting is completely anonymous and voluntary. 
it was mainly designed to interact with you and to verify if there's any significant clarification required. So we suggest that um, to uh, participate in this part of the session, as Mercedes mentioned before, you have uh, the electronic version of the labor care guide with you, and also, if possible, the user manual. Uh, given that we will use it uh, uh, several times during this this session, I guess for many of you, this is probably the first contact you have with the labor care guide. And uh, I, I have to assume that it could be a great challenge to get to know the, this tool in depth in only one session. So, however, let me clarify that there are some other uh, educational resources already available for you that will complement this webinar and that will facilitate uh, a deeper understanding on how to use the labor care drive. Okay, so let's start. Merce, would you move to the following one? I've moved already. I think that I have to stop sharing and risk sharing again. Hmm. Not sure what is happening. Can you see it now, Vera? Yes, yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So we all know that labor monitoring requires regular assessment to ensure the well-being of, of women and their babies. And the labor care guide will guide us on which parameters to assess, how to document them, when to intervene in the course of labor, and to make a shared decision with women and families. The labor care guide creates a, a positive feedback and decision-making loop as you, the healthcare uh, personnel, are encouraged to regularly follow these four steps. The step one is uh, assess, and that's to assess a list of parameters. This step involves assessing the well-being of the woman and her baby and the progress of labor. The second step involves uh, recording, which consists of documenting these labor observations that we are assessing at different points of time. We will start using the first column of the, of the labor care guide uh, to record the first assessment and use the, the other cells on the right to record subsequent assessments. We will we will go walk through uh, walk you through uh, an example, and this will become more clear as, as we move forward. Step number three is uh, to take the reference threshold, and this is mainly to compare our labor observation that we have just uh, registered uh, with the reference value in the alert column, and the last step that we usually record it at the bottom of the labor care guide involves deciding whether and what interventions are required. And ideally, this is uh, made in consultation with the woman and documented in, in the labor care guide. It is important for healthcare providers to prospectly monitor women and babies' well-being and labor progression and apply these four steps at each assessment throughout labor. The labor care guide is intended as a guide, but it's not in, in, intended as a substitute of good uh, clinical judgment. This is a, an important point. So quite frequently, the labor care guide will need to be adapted to, the, to each individual woman's circumstances and her preferences. The next one. So if we need guidance on how to complete, and probably at the beginning, you know, when we start using this in, in, in our own setting, we will need some, some support to start using the, the, the LCG, the labor care guide. So if we need guidance on how to complete 
each of these four steps, the usual manual, manual will guide will guide you uh, how to complete each of these variables. So if you can consult the manual now, that would be fantastic. So we can review together page number 12. And you can see that in step one, this step will guide us on how to do the assessment. And there's a description how to do the assessment. In step two, uh, there's a description on how to record that assessment. Uh, including where uh, it is, uh, we need to record either a numerical value or an abbreviation, depending on the type of variable we are recording. Then we have some description of how to proceed with step three, uh, where we describe what are the thresholds that uh, might, you might want to consider for each variable. And there's a brief description with some information that supports those thresholds. And finally, we have step four, that is uh, our plan. And there's a description that can guide you on how to continue monitoring, uh, either in the presence of a normal observation, but also in case of an abnormal value of each variable. So, as I mentioned before, it's quite likely that when we first start using the labor care guide, these charts will be consult consulted quite frequently. After a while, you, you won't need it, but probably at the beginning, it would be uh, uh, good to uh, keep this resource in mind. The following one. So let's go step by step in an example. Let's evaluate the fetal heart rate. Uh, how do I assess fetal heart rate? I know for, for you, you know, with your background, this is something quite simple. You do it in a, in a daily basis, uh, but it's just to go walk you through the example and to realize what type of information we have available in these charts uh, within the, the user manual. So the chart will describe in step number one, a systematic way to control the fetal heart rate. In this example, the chart uh, that you can find it in, in page 12, uh, suggests to listen to the fetal heart rate for a minimum of one minute, as could take during a, a uterine contraction and continue for at least 30 seconds after the construction, the contraction and, and, and the description continue. Uh, this uh, mainly correspond. This is mainly in the in the user manual, but this parameter that uh, this uh, I'm sorry, this step that we are describing, that is step number one, is what we found in the first column of the labor care guide. So here we have all the list of the of parameters that we will be uh, assessing, evaluating. And the user manual is the one that will give you some support with these descriptions. The next one. Okay, so let's move to step number two, the previous one. Step two. There you go. Thank you. So, how do I record? fetal heart rate in the labor care guide? And here the chart describes how to record these, these clinical parameters for the first stage of labor and for the second stage of labor. Uh, where do I record it in the SCG? I record the initial evaluation in the first blank cell, you know, where the first that we can see in, in blue color here, it will be the first blank cell for you. And all the following assessments will be uh, recorded in the empty cells. The space uh, where we record the assessment has to match the timeline in the top. So we record the time in the timeline and then the assessment at each corresponding time. The following one. Okay, so let's move to step number three, and this is take the threshold. Where do I find the threshold for this variable? In the chart, 
uh, of the manual, in the manual, I'm sorry, and in the LCG. So you will have both. There's a little more explanation in the manual. So we will highlight uh, the which are the values in this alert column for abnormal observations that require further assessment or actions. If labor observations do not meet any of the criteria in the alert column, labor progression and care should be uh, uh, regarded as as normal as possible and no medical interventions uh, should be required uh, but it also highlights uh you know those abnormal observations that might require an action from our side so we have descriptions in the chart in the user manual and there's also you can see uh, an explanation supporting these values, but we also have the alert column in the LCG. So this can act, you know, in, in daily practice, it can, it can help us to remind what are those uh, thresholds that probably will require some special attention uh, or further actions when we are working with, with, the, with women and families. It's just a, a, a very small but important uh, clarification related to reference thresholds that these are meant to use mainly as early warning signals. Uh, they don't, uh, you know, you can conclude a diagnosis based on, on only one of those values uh, and that they don't replace your clinical judgment. So these are mainly reminders and early warnings that can help us, can guide us, but uh, should not replace your clinical judgment. So now we can move to step number four. In the chart, this step will help us uh, to plan how to continue labor monitoring and uh, the care for the mother and the baby for each variable. And if there, there are any necessary actions that, that we need to apply. Once again, this is a general gu guidance. And this mainly apply when all the parameters remain normal. Uh, however, it is expected that the required frequency of assessment will depend mainly on the results of all the labor observations and the observations related to the women and the baby baby's status. Uh, so once you complete all the, those of those assessment, uh, it is expected that you record the plan at the very bottom of this page. In the chart that we see in the user manual, we have two different scenarios, uh, some guidance what to do if the if we don't meet the thresholds and what to do if we meet the thresholds. But once again, these are uh, for um, suggestions just uh, to, to help you, but uh, it won't replace your clinical judgment. The following one. So now we will go more, uh, uh, in more detail, uh, into more detail, and we will review section by section. So we have just learned that the labor care guide is divided into seven sections. The first one is usually completely completed only once, and that's when the active first uh, stage of labor is diagnosed, while the rest of the sections will be completed several times throughout labor and, and childbirth. And we have the name of each section in the labor care guide. As you can see, it's quite tiny here, but section two says supportive care, section three, baby, that is care of the baby and so on. The only section that don't have a, a title is section one, that is the one that we use only during uh, probably the admission of the woman to labor care guide. So let's go through, uh, what section by section. The next one. 
So let's start, of course, with section one. This is identifying information and labor characteristics at admission. This section is directly related to the definition, the definitions of the active first stage uh, uh, recommended by WHO in 2018. Uh, we have two new definitions, the latent first stage, which is a period of time characterized by painful uterine contractions and variable changes of the cervix, including some degree of effacement and slower progression of dilatation up to five centimeters for first and subsequent labors. So that's the definition we will use for Latin first stage. And we have a new definition for active first stage, which is a period of time characterized by regular painful contractions uh, and a substantial degree of cervical effacement and more rapid cervical dilatation from five centimeters until full dilatation for first and subsequent labors. These definitions are especially important when using the labor care guide because it is suggested that the labor care guide uh, be start being used once the woman has begun the active first stage. Let's uh, move to the second one. Yes, so um, let's see what section one consists of. Se section one is for documenting women's name and labor admission characteristics that are important for labor management. Those are mainly parity, mode of labor onset, date of active labor diagnosis, date and time of rupture of membranes, and risk factors. Risk factors, we can have a long list, but we are uh, trying to uh, record, to register mainly those that are relevant for labor monitoring. This uh, section should be completed with the information obtained uh, when active labor diagnosis is confirmed. Here at the bottom of the slide, we can see an image of section one, although it's, uh, we, we cut this image to make it bigger, it's, it to still look quite tiny. So if you had the, the labor care guide at hand, it will surely be easier to read it in, in your version. So let's try to take a look uh, to, to the file you have um, to, to review in more detail. The follow one. So as mentioned before, it is likely at first that uh, we will require some guide guidance to complete each section until we get more familiar with the tool. So if we can go to page eight in the user manual, we will find a chart that it was specially designed to complete uh, the variables in section one. As this section is uh, usually completed in a, in a single step, just after the woman enters the active first stage, it does not have guidance for this uh, four step that we will follow for most of the sections. In, in this case, uh, we, we will all also provide some guidance on step one, that is the assessment, and step two, that is recording. It, it doesn't really apply uh, step three and, and four for this section in particular. But you can see that we can find here um, uh, more details, you know, we list all the variables in the first column that are in section one, and there's a, a brief description of how to make an assessment or some guidance on how to make an assessment, and then there's guidance on how to record it. And how to record it, it will be somehow useful because uh, we will also describe all the different 
categories for those variab variables that require abbreviations. We will use abbreviations quite a lot in this liver care guide because of uh, uh, the space that is available to is, is uh, not so big. So we will provide all that information that is necessary uh, to use abbreviation in the in step number two. But let's go through um, an example that would probably help us to understand a little bit more how to complete the labor care guide. Rose, are you ready to present the example? Rose were having trouble with her connection. So um, maybe I, I can take you through the examples and hopefully Rose will join. Um, Rose have uh, used the LCG in, in the pilot testing study that, that we did and, and um, hopefully she will uh, join and, and, and be able to, to be here with us. So um, on um, how to complete this first um, section, um, this is uh, the example that we also use in the user's manual to, um, <clears throat> to help people understand uh, how to complete the LCG. So I, I will just read it, read the example so you get to know uh, the woman that we will be um, uh, supporting uh, during labor uh, in, in this presentation and then um, show you how to use this information to complete this first section. So um, this is uh, Mary Jane, is a low risk pregnant woman. She presents with contractions and uh, says that she has experienced leakage of fluid from the vagina for uh, the last hour. And this was at 6 um, a.m. Uh, her gestational age, age is 38 weeks. This is her fourth pregnancy. She previously had two births, one um, live birth and one um, a stillbirth uh, at term. Uh, and she also had a miscarriage. Um, She's uh, taking oral uh, iron to treat um, her anemia. The midwife in charge of the admission asks all the necessary questions uh, to take her history and offers uh, uh, Mary Jane a clinical evaluation to assess the baby's well being and her labor stage. Um, the midwife found that Mary Jane has regular constructions, three every 10 minutes, and she's five centimeters dilatation with ruptured membranes. So um, just coming back <clears throat> on this slide on uh, what Veronica explained you about this loop of um, assessing, recording, and um, planning for uh, her care. When it comes to this section one, what you will be doing is assessing and taking her history and then recording in this uh, section at um, the, the top of the labor care guide, um, your findings and the information that will help you um, manage um, her uh, labor better or identify any risk. So this is how it looks like when you complete the section one. So her name, parity, based on the information that uh, we have here about her live birth and stillbirth, um, a spontaneous labor onset, the date, um, rupture of membranes, the dates, and also the time. And as she, this is estimated to, um, to had happened at 5 a.m. And then as risk factors, her history of uh, having a stillbirth and um, anemia, and she um, is taking oral um, iron uh, for that. So now we, uh, we wanted, uh, and, and we will have, as Veronica explained, some questions uh, throughout this presentation just to, make this presentation a bit more dynamic. Um, so the first question, and um, I think that you can see the poll option 
already. Um, the first question is, should a midwife use the SCE when a pregnant woman presents to the healthcare facility in active first stage of labor? And this is five centimeters cervical dilatation or more. And you have to option uh, yes or no to answer. Remember, this is completely anonymous and uh, it's just for the fun of uh, uh, having a bit more of interaction uh, with you. Um, and then I will pass over to Veronica when we have the responses. So she will um, give you the right answer and tell you uh, why. Let's give a, a few seconds. And I think there are many people voting, that's good. <laughs> Okay, so this could be a few seconds more and we will be ready to close and see the results. We just stop it uh, when you wish, Veronica. Yes. Okay, the last few seconds to vote and we will close it. Hello, hello Veronica. We have many people voting in the chat. Uh, please, can ah. you vote on the uh, uh, online questionnaire that is showing on your screen, uh, not in the chat? Thanks, Nancy. Yes, thank you. That would allow us to show you the results. So ideally, you should be voting uh, in the poll that, show, that pop up in your screen. OK. I think I will end up the voting now so we can see the results, which are really good. Okay, can you see the results? Yes. I think that people can see them. Okay, great. So almost all of you um, chose the right question that is uh, yes. And don't feel bad if, if, if you uh, chose, have chosen uh, option two. It's the first contact with the LCG. Um, so yes, uh, that is the right question, the, the right answer. Documentation on the LCG should be initiated when the woman enters the active first phase uh, of the first stage of labor. That is five centimeters or more of cervical dilatation. Uh, and that is regardless of her parity and the membrane status. So although the LCG should not be initiated in the latent, latent first uh, stage of labor, it is, it's important to clarify that it's expected that that woman and, and the baby are monitored during the latent first phase, first, uh, first oh, you, I'm sorry, uh, first stage, they should be monitored but it shouldn't be recorded in the labor care guide. The labor care guide was designed uh, you know, to follow up all these parameters starting at five centimeters uh, of cervical dilatation. So thank you for participating. We will have uh, uh, some other few questions when we move through the, the presentation. Okay, so Let's go to section number two, and this is supportive care. This is a new section, a very important one. And this section is directly related to the following recommendations for intrapartum care. So it's related to respectful maternity care that is a fundamental human right for all women. And it's a core component of the WHO intrapartum care recommendations. Uh, this section is also related to uh, these other recommendations. A companion of choice is recommended for all women throughout labor and childbirth, relaxation and manual techniques, parental opioids and epidural analgesia are recommended for healthy pregnant women requesting 
pain relief during labor and childbirth. And that will, this will depend on women's preferences. Also encouraging the adoption of mobility and a birth position of the individual women's choice, including an upright position is recommended. And for women, a low risk oral fluid and food intake during labor is recommended. So these are the guiding principles when this labor care guide was designed. Uh, let's move to the second one, so we can explain section two a little bit more. There you go. Thank you. So section two of the labor care guide, that is supportive care, aims to encourage the consistent practice of respectful maternity care through the continuous provision and monitoring of, of supportive care. This includes labor companionship, access to pharmacological and non-pharmacological pain relief, ensuring women are offered oral fluid and techniques to improve uh, their comfort, uh, such as uh, encouraging women to be mobile during labor. Here at the bottom of the, the slide, you can see an image of section two. We have the four variables and uh, the alert values or the thresholds we need to use as, as reminders. Uh, if you have the LCG handy, please uh, try to check this. It, it will be much uh, easier to see it in your own version. Um, so we will um, record in the first column that is empty right now and we will continue recording further assessments in the, 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 the other blank spaces on the right uh, side of the LCT at different points of time. So let's check what the user manual suggests for completing this section. The next one. So if we go to page 10, we can find the chart uh, with each of the variables of section two. Now for this section and all the following ones, the charts will recommend how to complete the four step, steps to, uh, to use the labor care guide. The variables uh, will describe, uh, the, we will describe the variables and how to evaluate them. In the second step, uh, we, it will be explained what options you have to record this variable the third one will represent the alert values. And finally, we will have some guidelines on how to proceed uh, in different scenarios with, for continued monitoring. So uh, we can see, uh, the, the, you can review it in more detail, the examples um, that we have. And here we are showing that in the bottom of the LCT, uh, we have a list of abbreviations that, you know, after a while you won't need to look at them, but at the beginning it, it would be useful to use, to, to identify where this section is. Here you have some brief instructions and a list of abbreviations, mainly for variables like these ones, the ones that are in supportive care that we won't be able to write and we will need abbreviations. And ideally, to be consistent, uh, we should use you should use it in a consistent way so that uh, anyone in the team can understand uh, our assessment and what we are recording. So there's a, a more detailed list of abbreviations in the user manual in the in pages six and seven, uh, but you still have this uh, short list here at the bottom that it will be useful. There's uh, one practicality, practicality regarding this section. Supportive care measures uh, should be often evaluated continuously during labor and childbirth. Uh, so we are recording these variables um, on uh, every hour, but this is more you know, because we need to find a practical way to record these, these practices. But actually, uh, we will be offering and trying to assess uh, continuously all these parameters during 
during labor and childbirth. We have an example and we can see um, how to complete this section. Thanks, Veronica. So Rose uh, just joined. Hi, Rose. Um, Hi, everybody. Sorry. So um, do you want to just kick off with presenting the example? I can. OK, sure. Yeah. So I'd let you go. OK, thank you. So we can see this example on how to fill Section two, this is an example of uh, Mary Jane. She received a general and clinical assessment and she has been admitted to labor ward. She is monitored by a midwife on duty, but then she's not accompanied by any relative, someone from her social network. She reports feeling significant pain due to uterine contractions and requests pain relief. And she drank fruit and is walking. Now the midwife who is caring for monitoring offered her companion of her choice. Mary Jane wanted to be accompanied by her sister and the midwife gave directions to Mary Jane's sister as to when and how to call for assistance. Rose, people are saying they can't hear you. Oh. Should just I? maybe come closer to, to yes. your mic. Yeah, thank you. So I'm uh, saying Mary Jane is with her sister now. She's receiving instructions. Can you hear me? You, you, you're very far. Your voice is very Can you get closer to the mic maybe? I am. Maybe you read it for them. I am close. Better. OK, better. Now it's better, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. So I was reading a Mary Jane's case, as you can see on your screen. But on this last sentence, you are saying Mary Jane is with her sister now as a companion, using relaxation techniques for pain relief. She has been drinking water when thirsty, and Mary Jane is now lying in bed in a supine position. Can you move to the next slide? Now, if we want to document this, we can see the records for Mary Jane. On step one of assessment, you fill in a place for her records, for her data. And if the woman is assessed well, I'm very sorry. Ah. If the woman is assessed well, the records are as you can find them here. The threshold is written. Maybe you can go through. Yes, thank you. You can go through your manual later to observe more on how you can fill this. But all the records which we have read in the section can be filled, as you can see, following the assess record and checking reference threshold. So in checking reference threshold, we are comparing labor observations with the reference value on a let column. Next. For those who can't hear me, you can see the example on your screen where we have highlighted not accompanied by a relative, Issues on fruit fluid, juice, and walking, and also pain relief. These are key issues which you, you need to record on your labor care guide. Note the time, a replacement of a companion on the sister, and relaxation techniques for pain. You could see issues of dehydration, drinking water, and lying in bed. This is what we noticed in that example. So I'm seeing other people do not hear me, but I give you two minutes to read and check on your screen.
Cross, I will move to the next slide. Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so now, uh, Veronica, I'm back and we will review uh, now section three. This section, it's about the care of the baby. So we are all more familiar with this section that is quite similar to the previous part of graphs. This section is directly related to these uh, recommendations listed here for intrapartum care, intermittent auscultation of the fetal heart rate with either a Doppler ultrasound or a pinar stethoscope is recommended for healthy pregnant women. <clears throat> Continuous cardiotocography uh, is not recommended in healthy women undergoing spontaneous labor. It is recommended to auscultate every 15 or 30 minutes in active first stage of labor and every five minutes in the second stage of labor. And there's some guidance on uh, assessing caput, molding, and the status of amniotic fluid uh, regularly during uh, labor to identify risks of adverse birth outcomes. The next one. So section three, care of the baby was designed to facilitate decision making while we are monitoring the well-being of the baby. The well-being of the baby is monitored by regular observations of baseline fetal heart rate and decelerations in the fetal heart rate, as well as the amniotic fluid, the fetal position, molded, molding of the fetal head and the development of caput sucedaneum. Here at the bottom, we have the image of section three and all these six parameters. And as we know, the second column will give us the reference thresholds as reminders. This ne next one. Let's take how to uh, use the user manual for completing this section. If you go to page 12, we will find the chart with each of the variables of section Three, the charts indicate how to complete each of the four steps uh, um, that we recommend for completing the labor care guide. So if we can go to amniotic fluid, we can assess what is the status of the membranes in the step one. Is there leaky leakage of amniotic fluid? If yes, what is the color of the amniotic fluid? Then uh, we have several options to record this assessment. That is step two. We can use I for intact membranes, C for um, when, when amniotic fluid is clear, N for meconium stain fluids, or B for bloody stain fluid. So we will, have, we will find a lot of guidance there that should help us completing the LCT. Then in step three, we uh, there would be the alert values for this variable. Um, so we can see that uh, thick meconium and blood stain me uh, meconium are the alert values. And finally, we have the section, uh, uh, the plan section, and some suggestion on how to proceed with the monitoring of labor uh, after each assessment, either if we found that this observation was normal of abnormal. Okay, we can go through the example now. Should I read for them? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is example number uh, for section three completion. We all know section three is about the baby. So the baby moves during monitoring and shows a heart rate of 140 beats per minute at 6 p.m. without deceleration. Vaginal examination shows five centimeter dilatation, cephalic presentation, and there is no caput or molding, and the fetal position is occipital. Amniotic fluid is clear. At 6.30, Fetal heart rate is 136 uh, at uh, 6 p.m. without deceleration. At 7, fetal heart rate 132 beats per minute 
with variable deceleration. Now, 7.30, we see if it without deceleration. The midwife checks Mary Jane's pad and observes that the amniotic fluid is still clear, given that the other clinical parameters are normal and that Mary Jane is coping well with labor. Her midwife continues checking fetal rate every 30 minutes as Baru, and we check the amniotic fluid during the next vaginal examination. Now, to complete this in labor uh, care guide, let's check the next slide. Here we see, again, we have highlighted important parameters, which is time, as you can see, the 140 bits per minute, without deceleration, caput and molding, and fetal position in occipital posterior. Amniotic fluid is clear. Is, uh, you have seen that. And fetal heart rate here is highlighted. Again, all the times are highlighted. We see the fetal heart rate 148 bits per minute without deceleration at 7.30 p.m. So we see the labor care guide below here. We can see the baseline fetal heart rate and then 136, 152, and for deceleration, we find here normal, normal, varied, and normal. Fetal position here, occipital position, is being highlighted. So when we get a woman with such, it's easy filling in the labor care guide. Next. Next. Oh, check us with some practical examples. This is the question for everybody to respond. Should the midwife cycle observation meeting a criterion in the alert column to highlight normal observations? So you can vote. Is guided either yes, put one, or no, put number two. Okay, so we open the poll. You are you can start voting. Thank you for the participation. It's very nice to see so many people voting and so fast. So should the midwife cycle observations meeting a criterion in the alert column to highlight normal observations? Is it for normal observation or for abnormal observations? Okay, people still voting. <clears throat> we will close quite soon. So we are. It's recommended to to cycle the observations, and we have to decide if we do that when our observation is normal or abnormal. Okay, let's close and see the results. Okay, this, this is really important for us because it requires some clarification. So all the, uh, the list of thresholds are reminders for us that we should take every time we complete the LCG, we compare uh, our observation with that threshold. And if we meet that criteria, it means that we are uh, reaching a threshold and that requires some special attention and probably some actions. And we are planning to cycle those observations that meet the criteria from the alert column. So we will cycle abnormal observations. So this will be useful for us in order to make the right plan to continue monitoring labor 
and also for our colleagues if we are working in a team and we are highlighting uh, that relevant information for them so the right uh, answer is is uh, option two a healthcare provider should cycle any observation meeting the criteria in the alert column this is mainly to highlight abnormal observations and this should help uh, to highlight those observations that require special attention. Well, thank you for participating. Okay, let's go to section four. This is another quite familiar section for us. This section is uh, directly related to the following guidance for intrapartum care that we know maternal temperature, blood pressure, and the urinary output should be regular monitored to identify risk of adverse, adverse birth outcomes and to assess the well-being of the woman. The next one. So section four, care of the woman in the LCC, is it was designed to facilitate decision making. Veronica, so sorry. Just to, I want to get go back to uh, section three. Some colleagues are on asking clarity on your uh, on the explanation um, the, for the answer which you have given. Is it yes, no, and if it is whatever it is, what is your explanation? That's still uh, asking the question. Yeah, please. Okay. Yes. Sure. So we shouldn't. We should not cycle observations, uh, normal observations. So we shouldn't cycle when we have a normal observation. Sorry if this, is, this was so confusing, but it's a good uh, chance, a good moment to clarify this. So for example, what we are seeing in the screen here, the only one that is cycled is P of posterior. And if you see the column next to this observation, Actually, P and T, posterior and transverse, are our thresholds. So when our observation match the, the value, the reference value in the alert column, that is what we are highlighting. Because we want to highlight what is a, a threshold and would require special attention. We are not highlighting normal observations. We didn't highlight, for example, amniotic fluid that was clear or caputal molding that were normal. I hope that clarified the point. And just to show here, for example, the example on supportive care where that care is not available or not um, requested by the woman, for example, and it's no, then it's also circle here. Okay, so we'll go, go back to section four, care of the woman, which is, this is a, an easier section because we are more familiar with it. And this uh, section was designed to, to monitor the, the well being of the woman by the regular observation of these. Uh, variables, uh, pulse, uh, blood pressure, temperature, and urine. And uh, here we have the image that we can find in the user manual and how it's suggested to be completed. There's some guidance in page 15 of the user manual. Uh, and we can, we can find how, how to complete each of these variables. The chart indicates how to complete the four steps uh, step one, we, uh, once again, we have the description on how to do, how to perform the evaluation. The second step explains which are the options to record uh, what we have just evaluated, our own observation, then the, uh, the alert values in the step three, and finally some guidance on how to proceed with uh, uh, the plan. All these observations are evaluated and recorded every four, four hours, and you will find in the manual some different guidance. Uh, depending on the section, there are 
there could be different frequency for mo for monitoring. Uh, but this depends on, on each clinical case. So these are only suggestions, but if everything is, is perfectly well, we can assess these every four hours, uh, but this could be completely adapted to each clinical case uh, and in accordance with local guidelines. Uh, it is suspected that the required frequency of assessments will depend not only on the result of one observation, but all the observations that evaluate the status of women and babies' health. So we, yes, Rose? Rose, just for in, in, in the interest of time, I was wondering, I will move to the next slide and so people can see how to complete the LCG with the information we provide. So we can at least cover section five yeah. uh, today. Hi. So we can see an example of how to complete care of the woman as a my colleague has said this is an area where that's what we have been using the previous photograph, almost the same. But here we see the highlighted parameters of Mary Jane at 6 in the morning and then at 10. These, according to previous question, you see we highlight the abnormal. You see? So... For example, Mary Jane passed urine at admission without protein or acetone. So you look at the, if there's protein or acetone. And at 10, Mary Jane passed 96 beats per minute with blood pressure 124 over 84. Temperature, you see, normal. She passed urine again without protein or acetone. So you see, key thing is protein, acetone. I think we can see how it is uh, the urine plus plus is negative, is dash. Temperature here, normals are here on their lab, but then we see 36.5, 36.9. They are filled in as Mary Jane presented. Let's see again a small practical question. If we ask, does the frequency of recording maternal well-being in labor care record depend on woman's clinical status? The question number one, you are going to vote either yes by putting number one, or yes, and or you are going to vote two. Thank you, Samuel. Started. Okay, we can start the poll. Now it's available. So that's the frequency of recording maternal will be in the labor care guide depend on women's clinical status. So as a clarification, we usually provide some guidance on the frequency of monitoring, but we try to see here What's more relevant? What is uh, this guidance that are in the chart for uh, women's clinical status um, and what we found in each particular clinical case? Okay, these are the last seconds and we will close and show you the results. Okay, we are closing. You can see the results now. And this is good for us because we can we have the chance to clarify this. I know it's a lot. It's the first time we are reviewing the labor care guide. And the right answer is yes. So although the labor care guide and the user manual suggest certain frequency of monitoring. And this will happen not only in this section, for each section, including the labor care guide. It is really important that healthcare personnel 
adapt the monitoring frequencies. Sorry, I think you couldn't see that. Uh, to each particular clinical case and also in accordance to local guidelines. So this is a very important point. This is just a guidance that might help, but it is more important to analyze each, the woman's clinical status uh, in each clinical case and make decisions based on that, on how frequent I should be assessing and recording all these four parameters related to maternal health. Okay, thank you for participating. We are now moving to section four. We are getting close. There you go, thank you. So Pero, section- uh, Veronica, um, I, I think this will be a good place to stop and take questions because uh, we have a lot of questions in the chat and maybe we can continue next time. Uh, I think it will be good to stop uh, at this point, we have very, very many questions. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. I think of, uh, Muna will take us through the discussion. Okay. Uh, th thank you very much and good afternoon, colleagues. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can hear you. Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, there are a lot of questions as Nancy said, and uh, maybe we um, we start uh, with some of them and then continue. And uh, um, one, one of the, some of the questions which comes very uh, repeatedly is uh, uh, in the new labor care guidelines, should, con should we consider active labor being five centimeter or six centimeter? And uh, what makes the difference starting active phase from five centimeter, but not four centimeter like before? Uh, this has uh, this question, a number of uh, people have asked this question. And um, the other is, uh, please, uh, if you can um, answer whether the previous part of graph is going to be phased out. And if so, um, when, do, when is it going to be, this uh, LCG is going to be initiated or started um, in the country and in the health facility and so on. And a related question is, um, what is the legislative framework to um, initiate these um, new, uh, new recommendations? Uh, maybe let's start with those two questions. And I think it's related with the Mercedes presentation or Veronica and Rose. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can start and then um, Veronica and Rose can add um, to my um, responses. So I have been answering a lot of those questions around definition of active first stage and uh, it is four, five or six centimeters. And um, I know that uh, you were, probably teach and use and were using the four centimeters definition, but um, WHO uh, revised the evidence and in the 2018 um, guideline, uh, there's a number of recommendations on um, new definitions and active phases defined as of um, from five centimeters. And this is because what the evidence shows is that is that the, the inflection um, cervical time of cervical dilatation when women start from pass from progressing slow to a more rapid progression in cervical dilatation. And I, I just wanted to refer you to that document if you want to look at the evidence on underpinning uh, uh, those changes. Um, the LCG is the tool that is replacing the previous partograph and um, we gave some background at the beginning on, on why is that? Uh, and uh, one of the reasons being these new definitions of active um, first stage of labor, the new knowledge that we have around labor progression, and also uh, that willingness to also include um, the experience of care in, um, into a, a labor monitoring 
tool to improve uh, quality, as well as uh, trying to address some of the issues about, for example, retrospective uh, completion of the partograph when there was no um, plan uh, across labor that had needed to be uh, recorded. Um, in terms of um, the legislations and uh, kind of changes that will be needed, included in training, I think that um, at the beginning uh, in the opening remarks, um, some of my colleagues um, refer to that. And uh, we will be working closely with the different agencies and with countries to introduce uh, the labor per guide and also uh, with facilities. So the idea is that we will support the, um, those that want to, uh, to introduce a labor per guide, let's say now and early adopters, but uh, we will be developing additional tools so people can just take it forward and, and um, make sure that all women uh, in all countries uh, can be cared um, with um, the LCG. Um, so uh, this, this will require some time. Of course, uh, we, we have thought about all these different issues and have started working with, um, with the stakeholders on, on that. But uh, I just wanted to say that we also need you uh, on the ground to help us um, introducing the labor care guide in your clinical practice and uh, from uh, where you are also, you know, passing the information up. So uh, the, the enable environment uh, is there and, and we really count on you uh, for, for this. Um, I, then uh, Vero or Rose, I don't know if you want to add something. Well, you have said it all, but uh, on section five, when later we find the WHO recommendation for this, where the labor may not naturally accelerate until a cervical dilatation threshold of five is reached. So if people will do go back and refer to all those recommendations, WHO recommendations 2018, they will see the reasons why it has changed. That's all. Thank you very much, Mr. Perinuka. Do you want to add anything? No, I think it was covered. You know, the, the LCT was, will be useful starting at five centimeters. And before that, we insist that uh, women require monitoring, uh, but the NCT itself, if you start using it, it won't be so useful. You, you won't have some thresholds. Uh, so that's why it has, it's important to complete in the NCT to start with the diagnosis of active first stage of labor. Thank you very much. And I see a lot of people also appreciating the presentation and a really useful webinar. Congratulations to the presenters. Um, now moving into uh, other questions um, for Veronica uh, and Rose, maybe there are some uh, detailed questions like, you have two sales for each hour on the um, fatal heart bit monitor, FHR. Are sales meant to be filled in 30 minutes apart or both at the same time as a range? Yes, thank you for the question. So we will use each cell to, to record uh, the fetal heart rate, one uh, for the first 30 minutes and the second one for the second 30 minutes. So we will record this observation every 30 minutes and we are using a different cell. Uh, some other observations don't require such a frequent monitoring, and that's why we can, uh, you know, the space is a little wider. Uh, and if you if you use the the chart in the manual, you can see that some others will even, you know, it could it, it would be suggested to leave it blank, not to complete it, because for example, all those variables related to maternal health uh, don't require uh, recording and assessment on a uh, hourly basis, 
uh, we won't record it uh, every hour, so we just keep it blank and, and record it every four hours. So that's why each variable, you know, there are, uh, it's suggested to be recorded or, or monitored monitor with different frequencies, and that's why uh, the space provided could be a little different for each variable. Okay, thank you. I think that uh, that's, that would clarify. Um, another question is why are some time highlighted, some of the time are highlighted and some not? Oh, I think that was mainly something practical to show the example. So uh, what is highlighted is mainly to see, to show that it has to be recorded in the timeline. But actually, you know, what we record in the timeline is uh, the time that we initiate, that we start using the labor care guide. And then we need to match the time, the real time with the hours of labor. So it will always be more or less the same. If we start at six, then we will record uh, one hour uh, in each of the subsequent cells, in the, the, the following cells. If we start recording at five, the second one will be six, seven, eight, and so on. And once the woman complete the full dilatation, we will stop recording in the first section that is uh, the active first stage and we will jump into recording time in the second stage. But we should be recording the real time hourly. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is uh, um, they, they wanted to know if the new partograph uh, has provision to newborn details and monitoring within the first six hours post delivery. Uh, like, uh, like, in, as it, like the old uh, partograph. Can can you repeat that question? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. That the new partograph have provision to the newborn details and monitoring within the first six hours post delivery. Um, so, um, no, this is not included in the LCG. Let me just, well, you, you, you probably have it. Yeah, and another, another similar question is uh, any section considered to monitor immediate postpartum period with, with the new partograph? Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to come to a slide where you can see it if, if you don't have it um, handy, but um, okay. So the labor care guide includes the active first stage of labor and second stage. And I, I saw a lot of questions also, and I would add on latent um, things, which is not a part of um, what has to be um, recorded um, in the LCG. It doesn't mean so, and, and, and this has to be clear that there's no need to monitor and to support those women in the Latin fence. But we open as as we were opening before, for example, the um, the modify uh, WHO partograph at four centimeters. So the active first stage, we open the LCG at five centimeters, the new definition for active first stage. And uh, what uh, changes here is that we added second stage that is not uh, part of the previous uh, partograph. And there's no um, recording of um, third stage or the early postnatal period. It, it doesn't mean that it's not important. Um, and I know that in some countries, partograph was modified to allow uh, some key variables um, of a clinical status of the woman or uh, the baby to be recorded in the partograph, but this was not part of uh, the modified of the show, uh, partograph. Um, we expect uh, countries and facilities to adapt this tool, and uh, those are some adaptations that uh, could happen, but uh, uh, 
what you can see is that it's already very crowded for a one page document. So anything that is added might need an additional page, for example, to allow people to, to, um, to record that information if, if they think that it's important. I, I, I understand that sometimes it's the only um, paper where labor and uh, early postnatal care um, is recorded in some facilities. So I, 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 I completely understand uh, the, the concerns about not, not being able to, to have everything that we would like on, on one page. Thank you very much. And then um, another question is um, the presentation so far focused on first stage of uh, labor. How about the latent phase? And similar question also somewhere that uh, sometimes complications happen in latent phase and how do we monitor the latent phase? Yeah, I think I mentioned it, that issue of the Latin faith in, in my previous response. I don't know, Vero or Rose, if you want to add something. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and just, I'm, 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 I'm repeating what I say, but it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be monitored or record um, in, in her um, medical records. But um, when it comes to, um, continuous monitoring labor, the active first stage of labor is when uh, we um, we recommend people to open the, the LCG and and, uh, and use this tool for um, those periods. Okay, thanks. And uh, in terms of implementation, um, is there a geographic difference or is this a global guidance or is it only for Africa or low resource, uh, low resource yeah. setting? <laughs> I saw that question on the chat and, and it, it is a global guidance and mm. uh, uh, it was developed uh, with uh, that spirit in mind by the um, international uh, group of people and we, we took it to different stages and um, if we have time next uh, on the next webinar we could tell you more about uh, how the tool was developed and tested but um, the pilot testing that we did was performed in um, three countries in Africa, one country in Latin America and one country in Asia. And um, as I mentioned it before, um, there's um, translations on the way and additional translation in other languages that uh, we have already planned or, or, or have to consider. So th this, this is meant to be a, a, a global uh, tool, not only for, um, for, the, for Africa. Okay, thank you. And um, Lesotho already have uh, make a decision or um, to in, to adopt the WHO labor uh, care guideline in May 2021. And congratulations for that. Also, probably the first country to adopt uh, after the launch of the, the guideline. And they have requested a presentation. I think all the documents, including the records, will be shared. Um, Another question is in terms of practicality, um, especially in terms of the timing of the monitoring, for example, on uh, fatal heart rate monitoring every five minutes, especially using a photoscope, uh, the practicality is, uh, there is a question, a few questions around the practicality. Yes, I can take that, Mercy, if you want. So it is uh, recommended, it was recommended by the experts that developed the, the WHO recommendations to assess fetal heart rate every five minutes during the second stage. And, and we know, you know, uh, as you mentioned, there's a, a, it's a big challenge to record uh, fetal heart rate every five minutes. So there, what we do is, is mainly to select the value that it has uh, a high, higher relevance in terms of the clinical practice. So for example, uh, this will happen the same with how frequently we assess uh, uterine contractions. We don't have space to record it so frequently. So what we record, we select that value that is that it has the highest clinical relevance. And that's what we will be recording in, in that cell, in the space provided. Okay, 
Thank you so much. And I think maybe the last question uh, is uh, around the positioning of uh, the, the mother. Why are we restricted to turn the, uh, the mother on the left instead of allowing them to turn on uh, left or right, depending on which side improves the fetal heart rate? So I, I guess that is more like a clinical question. And, and you know, we, we might want to induce the time in trying to uh, review how to complete it. But actually, in the guidelines, we have cited two other documents that are very useful for clinical practice. So if you go to the manual, you will have two other guidelines from WHO that will be very useful. And there you will find this uh, type of answer for clinical questions. Okay. Okay, I think uh, in general, these are the, uh, the questions. Um, thank you very much for the clarification. If there is any important question, if uh, I left, please, Nancy and Fatima, uh, you, can, uh, you can take the floor. I, I think we will, we will consolidate the questions, look at them again, and then we can revisit them in the next webinar in the interest of time. So back okay. to Trifon. Okay, thank you very much. It's really exciting. And uh, I hope this is the first series, the first webinar of series uh, that we follow. I'm really happy that it has been very interactive. And now in the interest of time, I, wanted, uh, I want to give the floor to Jennifer Nyoni, who is our focal person for uh, health workforce, uh, to say something how she felt, what are the recommendations that she can give us, uh, because she also have another meeting immediately. So I want to give the floor to Jenny. Jennifer, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Trifoni. Thank you, colleagues. Um, uh, I really want to thank you for this opportunity. To, to say something indeed. Um, I will start uh, by acknowledging the role that the midwives play um, in reducing maternal mortality in our countries. And uh, with this new normal to especially acknowledge them as part of the core team of health workers who are providing care in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. And the, some have and are infected as we speak, while others have even died in the process. So it's really something that our unit is concerned about and we are actively following to see how we can support. So I just thought it is important to acknowledge that as the, you may have mentioned the, the previous speakers in the uh, opening remarks, uh, midwives as other health workers face many challenges and I know Fran will, will hear this again, that the sad aspects that at least even 53% of them at last uh, survey feel disrespected by other health professionals. And there are other challenges facing them as well as, as part of the health workforce, including high levels of workload due to shortages in countries, but they still soldier on providing care. Hats off to all of you. So as a region, we, we really appreciate this effort of capacity building. And to that effect, you, as you, some of you are aware, we have produced the uh, prototype curriculum uh, for midwifery as an effort to, 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 to try to standardize minimum standards that we believe will contribute to ensuring quality. We have one also for nursing and also integrated one. We also have the regulatory framework that many countries are using. Even other regions have made reference to that, that promote enforcing standards in countries. And also you may be interested, Chair and colleagues, that the current health labor market analysis that we are doing countries also try to confirm the needs of countries for the number of midwives uh, that are required and of what quality. So these efforts are towards that. We are also this year going to produce a regional report on nursing and midwifery to recognize the role of midwives and nurses. We also have done a project recently in four countries focusing on rural schools 
on the comp competencies of midwifery educators so that the lessons from there can inform processes like this. I would also like to acknowledge the partnership with the World Continuing Education Alliance for strengthening the capacity of health workers through their digital forum, forum which is very appropriate during this uh, new normal. Also, we thank them as a, as, because they are coming with a, a new opportunity to strengthen the training of our health workforce in other areas of women's, children and adolescent health. But as a recommendation, Trifon and colleagues, and as alluded to by the earlier speaker, we may need to begin to work towards institutionalizing these initiatives with our national training institutions, including our collaborating centers for nursing and midwifery, so that the training is more accessible to those who need them, especially those who may not really have access to these, these virtual forums that we organize at global and regional levels. And then this can be also an opportunity to provide this kind of orientations and training in a more systematic and sustainable basis. So the launch of this guide to me is very important. And you, you can see from the numbers who registered and the numbers who've been able to participate because of connection challenges, which are a reality in our region. So I, I think it's very important that if all of us can coordinate and see how we can make sure that this guide reaches all the audience, those midwives who are in those places uh, on the front line and they need to access it. So I really want to thank you organizers and we'll continue Trifoni to work with you to see how this guide can reach every midwife in our countries. Thank you very much, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, for really the observations that are very, very helpful. But also we take care of the, the very important recommendation that you just gave us. And we look forward to, the, to continuously collaborating with you. And we look forward to the regional report of, on midwives. It will help us to also do the advocacy for increasing of the number of midwives in the region. Thank you very much. And uh, really, I want to thank you for the time because I know you have another meeting that has already started. Thank you very much. But we continue to invite you for the next series. And then uh, we hope you'll be able to, to be available for us. Thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you, you're welcome. I'll make every effort to do that. It's always a pleasure to meet with yeah. people who contribute to saving lives. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good meeting. Uh, I, I, I'm not the pleasure to invite uh, um, Fatima uh, to say something. Maybe I'm sure she will address the, the, the issue of newborn. Uh, uh, thank you, and uh, you have the floor, Fatih. Thank you, thank you so much, <clears throat> Tiffany. And I'm part of uh, part of the team, so I will not take a longer time because there will be in future also we'll be interacting with each other. But one thing what I wanted to say to our colleagues who are uh, who are joining us today, all the midwives and nurses, and I know there are doctors also in the call wanted to learn more about it, um, that uh, it's, I know all of us are concerned that how would it be implemented? Uh, how would it be endorsed? And would you be able to translate this knowledge into practice in a near future or not? So just wanted to reassure you all that uh, while we are talking, we initiated it. You see the importance of nurses in midwives, we all understand it and that's why we initiated our first webinars with our frontline workers, with, with, with you, with the uh, backbones of the system. So then, and, and simultaneously, we will be working with, with our OBGYNs also, they are also the backbones. And then we would definitely invite uh, policymakers also. So it's, it's something which we'll be working with all partners together. And then whenever it reaches to your country, like Lesotho, if you are um, 
it, when you sit around the table for the ad adoption of this or adoption of this document, you would be in a better position to convince your policy makers, your decision makers, your programmers for, for the effectiveness of the tool. I, I mean, uh, we, as from UNICEF, I really wanted to look uh, to, to um, like one of our colleagues asked about newborn and I wanted to uh, also see newborn in it, but it's okay because all the things which we are doing in the form mother ultimately will have an impact on newborn. So while we, are, we go for adoption or adoption, we must, in like we do with, with the previous, uh, like the current photograph also, we are trying to, uh, many of us have added PNC component there, newborn component there. We can do the same thing with this one also. So we are really looking forward for your, um, uh, for your partnership, for your support uh, when it gets to your country and then you have now all the resources, you have the knowledge, the recent knowledge, and so you have the power to, to work according to the new standards and guidelines and new evidence. Uh, with that, uh, I will stop here and because we'll get more opportunities to interact. Over to you, Trifoni. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fatima, for the encouraging words. Uh, now, I think uh, we need also to discuss about the next steps before we close the meeting. I want to give the opportunity to Nancy uh, to present to us what uh, would be the next steps uh, the, uh, as we move forward. Nancy, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Trifoni. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you to our very, very um, experienced panelists for our wonderful webinar today. Uh, I'm seeing uh, quite a number of people asking about their pending question. And we just want to reassure you that in the next webinar, we are going to try and answer uh, some of the pending questions uh, before we proceed. So this webinar is in two series. And so the part two of this webinar will be on 11th March, 2021 at the same time uh, through the same platform. We will continue from section five, answer pending questions, and then continue with how to operationalize the labor care guide. So be sure to join us on the 11th of March, 2021. For those who are interested in, in, in French, uh, we are trying to link with our West African and Central African counterparts to have a similar webinar series for Francophone countries in which we shall try to have interpretation into Portuguese so that the Lusophone countries can also be able to benefit. There are those who have uh, expressed the interest in this process. We are working specifically with the country offices uh, the WHO country offices in collaboration with UNFP and UNICEF to organize for uh, the adaptation of the labor care guide as part of the uh, adaptation of the intrapartum care recommendation for a positive pregnancy experience. So you just link with your country offices so that they can send the request and we shall be on hand to provide the, the required technical support. There are some important links. Uh, the publications, you can get them on that link that we have shown on the screen. And then just another announcement that there is a quality of care network and midwifery webinar on March 17th that uh, midwives and nurses, you are also encouraged to join. We have also posted the links uh, to these uh, publications of the labor care guide and the user manual in the chat. And also, it has also been posted on the site for this webinar. The presentations are going to be shared on the site and also through the WHO, UNICEF, and UNFPA uh, um, um, office, offices uh, so that you can be able to access them. But the WCEA platform is going to, to post this uh, presentation on the on the platform we also are in process of um, 
making this particular training into a, an online uh, training that you can access under M Learning or E Learning on the WCEA platform. And once we do that, we shall inform all of you about it so that you can be able to access the online training and go through this in detail. As part of the country adaptation, we shall be also providing the orientation to this uh, labor care guide. So for the country teams, we will do in-country orientation as part of the adaptation process so that you have more stakeholders involved. And we hope to call on you who have attended this webinar to be with us and to support us in this process. With that, I would like to say thank you very much to the panelists, the WACEA, all the participants for a very great webinar today. And back to you, Trifoni. Over. Uh, thank you very much, Nancy, for the next steps. Uh, I want to say that we are still open to your ideas, and I want to congratulate everybody who has participated so actively in this webinar. Uh, we want to thank particularly our panelists for really the good presentation that is being acknowledged in the, in the chat box. I want to particularly thank um, the the, the team who has prepared this web, the face of this series of webinar, we, I think, uh, let me say, Mona, J um, uh, Nancy, Fatima, but also we, we, with uh, Sam and Craig from the World Continuing Education Alliance that have provided to us the platform. We can also not uh, forget your, the, the support of the Swedish government and also really the collaborative work that we are doing in the region. I think uh, I just want to assure you that together with UNFPA, UNICEF, we continue to support you. Please liaise with the, the different country offices, being from WHO, from UNICEF, from UNFPA, we'll be able to support you to make the reality the use of this uh, uh, new labor care guide. And with that said, thank you very much for having participated. We, we look forward to seeing you in the next uh, webinar. And thank you. Uh, bon après-midi à tout le monde. Thank you very much. We are really privileged to have you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and we hope to see you all on the 11th of March. I think, Sam, you can end the webinar. Yeah, thank everyone. you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thanks all.